and then right on uh, into uh, her uh, long and, and fruitful life uh, in the city of Rome. And uh, I just felt uh, blessed to be a part of that. that. That's the only way I can put it. Because uh, I, uh, I acquired a, yes, I, I, I got a, a pass. I got an entrance ticket to, to, to that past world. But that entrance ticket also gave me uh, a, a new avenue to, to, to see the world in uh, through my own music. So to come back, Jason, to your, uh, first, to your question, my first collaboration, well, it was in a wonderful show that took place at the uh, American Church in Rome, it's an Episcopalian church, but it was also like many of the American centers in Europe, they might have been church-based, but they were all cultural centers, and they all, uh, um, whether those in Paris or uh, in Rome or in, in other cities in Europe, uh, they became they became uh, places where um, experimentation and a, and a certain kind of uh, community uh, of, of uh, active uh, American artists uh, could, could, could work freely and, and express themselves. So Edith's show, uh, which, uh, for which I provided, provided a so-called soundtrack, I mean, I made a, a tape piece. Uh, I mean, it was a show of uh, oils, I believe, and, and watercolors, primarily. Um, uh, I that inspired me to actually make a, a sound piece uh, based on the sound of water. So just directly, it was just a direct translation for me to go out into Rome, which was full of, full of water, water, water everywhere, springing up from, you know, the paving stones and in the, in the courtyards where uh, in, in the 60s, uh, People actually uh, did their wash publicly, and you know, and scraping with the really board and stuff. So you heard this running water and sounds of water everywhere, and it was really quite remarkable. Uh, right in, in in the neighborhood uh, where we lived, which was uh, just a, a stone's throw from Piazza Navona, and and uh, a couple of stone's throws from the Pantheon. So really dead center in old Rome. Uh, uh, and a remarkable, uh, a remarkable neighborhood, uh, uh, not only for, not only for sound, but, but for the people who lived in it, uh, which were primarily uh, low-income uh, Roman artisans and, and workmen and uh, thieves and and. Uh, all kinds of all kinds, all kinds of people, but it was really in the heart of the heart, the heart of old Rome, uh, which uh, so many people have written about. Anyway, so all of these, all of these uh, thrilling uh, uh, and and inspiring experiences, uh, really, um, and, uh, was was the was the world in which uh, I, I was immersed uh, right from the, the middle 60s right up through um, 19, the middle 1980s when I continued to live uh, uh, in, in fact in Via della Vetrina where, where uh, uh, Edith had her apartment for many years until she moved around the corner. So uh, after being evicted. Anyway, um, th this period was one which enabled me to uh, be uh, intimately uh, uh, involved, at least as uh, an observer and, and, uh, and, uh, and an excited uh, partner in, in watching her work uh, over 20, 25 years uh, go from simple uh, still lives flowers, a vase, or this or that, into, into the work that 
uh, we see largely on these walls today, some of it all painted in very, very specific places uh, over a number of years. I'm just looking at one wall that uh, is painted uh, strictly, uh, well, some of them are studio paintings, but uh, most of them are paintings which were made in the, in the town of Los very near village uh, overlooking the, the small city of Wedinchi, which is in the Bay of Los Angeles, which is the Bay of the Palms, the Bay of the Shelly Brown, Shelly Brown, the Bible. northern Italy, on the northwestern coast of Italy, and uh, um, uh, Edith found this one um, simple top floor of a, of a country house, no indoor toilet, uh, no run, almost no running water. We had to take water from a well every day for, for just wash dishes and stuff for cooking. It was rainwater. And, um, and from her studio there, I painted this view looking out toward an island which is called Tino, which had a, a beautiful little lighthouse. There it is there. Uh, there it is there. There it is in, in, in 30 years of painting. Uh, and Edith decided in the end that she thought, you know, philosophically, that yes, she was a painter, but her really call her real calling in life was to eventually be a lighthouse keeper. And she wanted to be that lighthouse keeper. And <laughs> I mean, these are anecdotal but they're true. If we could ask Edith today, she would, she would definitely uh, agree with that. Uh, so that island was somehow uh, just one more object in the panorama, another part of her eternal still life in which she put objects in the foreground like some of these, uh, yeah, this, this bunch of stuff here, that, that vase with the dots on it, and uh, this one I don't remember so well, this little thing here. And she changed them from time to time, from year to year, and she would, she would mix them up. They would always be in, uh, uh, almost strictly speaking, in odd numbers. They would either be in threes, fives, or sevens. Never even numbers, I don't know what, what the mystique of that was, but uh, if you look at them, in, from an art historic perspective, you would find that. I mean, the, the series, she, she would do a series of three, five. Minutes. Well, I don't know. I don't know whether that was, I don't know whether Morandi came up with that or, or you know, I don't know where that came from. Uh, whether she got it from uh, a viewing uh, or older art. But uh, there were, there were I, I, let me add at this point, um, in this period, uh, Edith was uh, not only uh, uh, a, a full-time painter and a dedicated one, she was also a journalist because she had this uh, self-created job that she got at the uh, Herald Tribune at the time. It used to be called, uh, I mean, that was the, the paper for I mean, it came from the New York Herald Tribune, and it was the edition, the, the, the Paris edition or the European edition, and for, um, I don't remember the number of years, but certainly 25 years, she was the uh, kind of the self-appointed art critic from Rome. And it gave her the opportunity to uh, uh, open that side of 
her, her, cre her own personal creativity in writing because she, she loved to write and she was a very good writer and soon she became um, had a following in her art criticism uh, in the Herald Tribune and later uh, in, a, in a small um, bi-weekly uh, paper in Rome called um, Susan, what is it? Wanted in Rome. Wanted in Rome, yeah. And she, um, you know, she'd write about any, anything from from uh, Rubens to Basquiat, and with brilliant insight, brilliant language, uh, exciting, passionate. Uh, approach to just the act of being an artist. And this is what she always conveyed, that, that thrill of just putting paint on canvas, or a tear in a canvas, or throwing a bunch of stones on the floor, or whatever it was. She could handle it all. There was nothing. She had no no um, prejudices about the, the, the contemporary, the postmodern, the, the fluxus, you name it. She just threw herself into it and went right for the jugular because she understood why those artists were doing what they were doing. And she, she could bring that right, right off the page uh, into, your, into your own consciousness. She was really great at that. She made people understand <laughs> the thrill of making art, <laughs> the thrill of, 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 of this of this of this of this profession and, and this activity. Anyway, that, that was. Um, I mean, for example, I mean, she she has. Uh, uh, I, I can remember on a couple of occasions, uh, uh, let's say at a Cy Twombly show, who she adored personally. And, and knew personally and, and hung out with in Rome. Uh, um, I mean, uh, just brilliant art criticism. Brilliant in the sense of not only supportive and, and, and emotive, but, uh, uh, but uh, able to actually put in words uh, what this man was doing. And, and it's just not an easy thing to do. So, She'd be, she engaged both in, in the painting and the writing about art, uh, became this, this uh, kind of bifocal uh, 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 activity for pretty much uh, her whole life, I, I would say, her whole life in Rome. And, and she, she divided herself uh, quite uh, seriously between, between the two. But sitting here today and looking around, and yes, uh, you know, artists um, uh, tend to to uh, to be you know almost overproductive. They they can't stop. Uh, yeah, they'll have a bad moment. They'll have you know reflections. Ah, it's not worth anything. Throw this out. Throw that out. But uh, in the long run, it's it's a it's an activity that requires constant attention. Uh, I, I'm as a composer, I, I put myself uh, in 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 a reflective uh, perspective here because uh, uh, I'm not one of those composers who gets up every day and goes and writes music. Uh, in fact, I don't like composers like. They, they give you the creeps. Uh, the, so I never did that. And, and yet, uh, somehow I produced an enormous amount of music. I don't know how I've done it. But I, I, yeah, I, I do it when, when there's a demand for it, when there's an actual reason to do it. And then there's other times, and, and, and those were actually inspired in, in part uh, by many seasons uh, spent in the summers with Edith in this hilltop house in La Serra, where uh, I began to 
uh, I wouldn't say imitate or emulate, but try quite consciously and, uh, and necessarily to reduce uh, my own uh, compositional idea to the, to the simplicity and essentiality of Edith's work itself. So this, I mean, I, I look now in retrospect, I see these simple objects, these almost childlike gestures, these, 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 these spaces that she created uh, uh, quite magically, uh, sometimes really magically. And, uh, and, and I began at that same time to 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 um, to do things uh, along the same lines, and when, what I did was I had this music sketchbook, and I would I would uh, I decided I was going to write music that was only monophonic, that is only melodic, just one note at a time, no rhythm, no no harmony, no nothing, just pure melody. Kind of pure design, as it were, pure design in, in sound, and um, and that that ca that came right out of Edith's thing. Incidentally, a, a work did appear of mine, which is called Music for Every Occasion. I don't have a copy of it here. I, it it probably should have been in the show because there is. Oh, oh, oh there is, is in there the a, vitrine. Is there a, oh, there yeah. is. I didn't see it. Yeah. And uh, and Edith did the. Um, did the cover, quite a lovely cover, as she did on many of my LPs. Of course, that, that was all quite natural. It was in the family, and uh, and and then and then drawings uh, in between the chapters of the of this um, uh, uh, little uh, handbook of a pure melody, just pure song, as it were, and. Um, so that was a kind of a, a very inspired collaboration, and uh, not to mention, as I said again, the, the work that Edith did on my uh, first LP covers, uh, which which some of which were taken directly from her paintings, so uh, others of which uh, the, the magnetic garden, the Giardino Magnetico, as it was called, uh, was one that she created a, a special cover. Herself. I, I don't know if that's in, in the show either. But anyway, um, I guess what I'm saying here is that this uh, um, a relationship evolved uh, where uh, eventually we were, we were both uh, playing off one another's work and, and, and finding uh, especially myself, who, uh, in this case, uh, the younger person in a in a in a in a, in a, in a partnership, um, learning um, seriously how to be an artist, and uh, I, I, I couldn't have I couldn't have gotten there otherwise, and so uh, I mean. Beyond expressing gratitude <laughs> in retrospect, I mean Edith knew that all along, but uh, also uh, apparently my work uh, also stimulated a lot of uh, uh, idea and, 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 and consequences in, in her own. Uh, the thing is, we, we can look at some of these um, these seascapes and, and still lives and. Magical little, almost ch 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 child, childlike world that, that she created in uh, uh, in the uh, 70s, 80s, and 90s, and then you come to a wall like this, and you say, "Oh my God!" You know, we're back to abstract expressionism, and uh, a place that, of course, she grew up in. She grew up right in the backyard of, in the front yard of abstract expressionism. And, and then, uh, but
But these pieces are, are these explosive, uh, joyous um, um, recollections and reiterations of Greek mythology. Every single one of them has, has will probably uh, have a name, uh, Leda and the Swan, or, or I don't know what, you know, Athena, the birth of Athena, coming out of this or that. And, you know, these might not be the ones, but that's the idea. And so, uh, in the end, Edith was so inspired by this purity of, uh, of the of, of the line, of the shape, of the of the sweep, of the form uh, in in the great uh, period of uh, early uh, Greek sculpture and pottery, that she, like many Europeans, uh, because. In, in the end, she, she, she was, yes, very, very American, but deeply European, and so connected, hence connected, to, uh, to this original source of, of Western culture, uh, which is the Greek mythology. And, and she spent a good part, I would say, almost, uh, well, for one thing, she, she, she moved uh, her summer studio uh, primarily from La Serra, which was on this hill overlooking the Bay of La Spezia, to, um, uh, uh, oh, what's the name of it? Uh, Pietra Santa. Pietra Santa. I was going to say San Pietro. <laughs> Pietra Santa, uh, which was one of the, uh, which is the classic uh, home of the, the Carrarese sculptors. So um, she hung out with these burly sculptors and always hitting stuff. And, but it was still a, a, a place where she spent her summers now, uh, not alone in, a, in, a, in an airy, beautiful studio overlooking this marvelous uh, Bay of La Spezia, but uh, in, in a in a community of, of artists who, many, many, many of them American, who would go there to work with sculpt, uh, with, with marble, and uh, to work with the artisans who worked with marble every single day in these gigantic uh, marble uh, uh, labs that they had there. So uh, it was a, a world where she really went back in touch with other artists. And, and, uh, and it was there that she used the backdrop of, of the Carrara Mountains, that is those very marble mountains uh, that Michelangelo drew all of his blocks from, and all the great sculptors uh, supervised, you know, which block of mar marble they wanted to work with and, and, and this kind of thing. Very dangerous stuff, the way, you know, in the hills. So a lot of these pieces, uh, this this one in particular, you can see the, mm -hmm. the mountains. Um, uh, this looks like another one. Mm -hmm. This one I'm not sure of. But anyway, uh, um, yeah, this this one also. Uh, I mean, so these these works, which which um, which look like Edith has lost it. But she hasn't lost anything here. She's just regained another world of, of, of almost improvisational uh, spontaneity. And uh, uh, using, again, never losing sight of, of these inspiring mountains that, would, that now became the backdrop of, of, of her work. Uh, I mean, a backdrop of just, you know, A set, a set against which she would uh, do her imaginary uh, retelling of the Greek mythology. Um, I don't want to go into any more art historical stuff here because, I mean, 
so you're fantastic. You're great. You're great. That's great. But, <laughs> no, it's great. But, but uh, uh, it was so much of her know, life. Because, well, I mean, yeah. because uh, because uh, you, you know, I don't feel qualified <laughs> in, that, in that sense. But uh, the only thing I'm qualified to do is to sit here and feel like I'm sitting in my own living room, surrounded by Edith's works. Which, if, if you come to Rome, Susan and I have a, a quite a wonderful collection of pieces that we make. Uh, we, 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 we gathered over the years, either purchased or, or either sometimes we just say, hey, take this, or take that watercolor, or take the, you know, just, you know, just, just because uh, she loved us. Anyway, um, I don't, I don't think I can add anything to this. I think, uh, this is the place to close my story, and uh, uh, and uh, and let and let Edith's work just uh, go on and, and tell its own story, which it does, of course. And uh, I, I hope uh, New York responds to it. It's so interesting what you say about the uh, that you are connected on a level, not painting and music, but just uh, another level of ideas or, or inspiration. It's just uh, another level of, of, of commitment to 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 this uh, to this human activity which uh, which people uh, everywhere do because of necessity now we don't know always why we do it but uh, in in creating uh, artistic artifacts whether they're uh, physical and visible and portable like a painting or a sculpture or uh, uh, invisible and immaterial like sound, um, you, um, I mean, we, we, we use these as, as, as vehicles of transport uh, to get to places that we don't even know where we're going. Uh, but we know, you know, uh, that there's a lot of potential for these vehicles to take us, uh, you know, out of the daily grind, out of the daily muck, out of the daily misery <laughs> and stuff. And, you know, some of us have to do this work, and that's what we do. We're just artisans. We're just transcendent artisans. <laughs>